Cool. Okay. Two minutes late. Um, so about me, I'm very punctual. Just kidding. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Carlos Montemayor Elosua, but most people know me as JC because it's a very long name. Uh, I'm from Monterey, Mexico, and I've been living in New York for the last four years. I went to Tufts University to study computer science, and that's where I really found a passion for functional programming. Uh, and so even though now that I'm working in web, I try to be as functional as I can all the time. Um, for the last four years, I've been working for the New York Times. I've been working for their, uh, it's changed names a couple times, so it's basically their new products group. So this product specializes in finding product opportunities, building out prototypes, and launching full products. Um, and it's been really fun. I've worked on an app called NYT Now for news. Uh, an app called NYT Watching, where we will talk about today, you'll, so you'll see in a sec. And uh, starting Monday, I'm actually transferring over to lead the iOS development for NYT Cooking. So it's going to be a fun new adventure. Oh, and outside, like work and programming, I love to do, I'm a big hobby person. Uh, so I am an opera singer. Uh, excuse my sore throat today. Uh, I'm an opera producer, so with a bunch of friends, we produce an opera based on a doll's house. And my latest hobby is I'm uh, on my way to be certified as a wine sommelier. So if there's any, any people out there that like wine, please come talk to me after. So I talk about wine more than I do Redux, so. <laughs> cool. Um, so before we get started on this talk, I just want to give you a tour of watching because I'm going to use a lot of real life examples. Uh, so it's not all just like Redux theory, it's just like here are some problems and here's how we solve them. So watching is based on a thing called a recommendation. So this recommendation isn't like an a like, you know, machine learning, like recommended, it's just like it's an editorial thing. Um, so we write things based on movies or TV shows, in this case, Get Out, and we can tell you the year it was released, who's in it, uh, like a short summary, and we tell you why you should watch it or maybe why you should skip it. Uh, sometimes things are like really scary or like, you know, specific like triggers. Um, and we also tell you where to watch something, and that's going to come into play later in the talk. So we can tell you like, hey, this is available like on iTunes for $4.99. Um, you can save recommendations into a thing called a watch list. So this is like a save area. And the important thing here that I'm going to keep referring to is cards. So cards is one of those words that mean like a million different things at the times. But in this specific case, they're like literal UI elements called cards. Uh, you can save them, you can like them, and you can click the dot, dot, dot button to see where you can stream them. Uh, we have a thing called a feed. So in this feed, you can see some tags at the top. You can click them and kind of like browse through all of our recommendations. And there's like posts so you can read about the latest happenings in uh, the media world. And then the takeaway here is also, here are the cards again, and they're like in a list, and we call that list a carousel. So I'm going to be referring to a carousel. This is what I mean. You can click them, and they'll slide over. Um, I also mentioned the tags on top of the page, so you can click them to like search through our recommendation offerings. In this case, we clicked on the strong female lead tag. Uh, you should definitely watch Glow if you haven't. It's pretty great. I'm not, no one's paying me to say that. I actually really love it. Um, Cool, so that's, that's watching. And as I mentioned before, I work in the new products area of the Times, and uh, it's, it's kind of stressful when you're making a new product. Um, so we work, we have a VC model. So we, we what we have to do is pitch a committee an idea, and like we can be like, oh, we can do something with film, film and television, uh, and we, we think we can get this many readers using it in a year. Will you give us like X million dollars to build it out? Uh, and we have to do that every couple months. Um, so we first ask money to build it out, and then once we build it out, we have to prove that we were successful and we want to grow, so we have to ask for more money. Um, so before we started on watching, the goal was to launch an MVP version in less than a year. And as you can see, the word MVP, the acronym, is under quotes, uh, because in my opinion, it was much more than MVP. It was like full product with like saving and like a lot of features. Um, we also needed the ability to pivot and change features quickly, because um, you learn things, you launch things, you see how your users react, and you have to change quickly, because again, you're on like a timeline of a year or a couple of months to prove that your product is successful, or else they'll shut it down. Um, we also needed to like keep growing 
quickly, again, limited time, and you want to just like make as many features as possible. And um, how many people here are web developers? Cool. Any like non-web developers? Awesome. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean, this is like a problem with all kinds of software, but basically, yeah, you have a website and you need data. So like this arrow represents us getting data from a cloud for a recommendation. But you know, there's more data, so we need to get the user from the cloud also. Uh, and once we have our user, we can tell the like save component, hey, now you should check if anything's saved or not like, in the cloud. And like oftentimes you have your thing with like multiple clouds, and so. Just by looking at all the arrows here, you can, you can tell it's like a, you know, I mean, you know, because you program. Uh, it gets messy really quickly, and the more arrows you add to this diagram, uh, it's more headaches. Um, so we're dealing with this. We're dealing with very strict product requirements uh, that we need to grow quickly and show success. Um, so we decided to use Redux um, to help us meet all those goals, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, before we get to the agenda, I always like to know who here is uh, new to Redux, here to learn, awesome. Who here is like, things are intermediate in Redux? And who here has been using Redux for a long, long time, by which I mean two years, because that's, that's all, it's been around for two years or three. Cool. That's great. It's a good mix. Okay. So first, we're going to talk about what unidirectional data flow is, which is kind of like the philosophy of Redux. Uh, so I'm going to take you through. Um, the steps of taking your state, turning it into views, uh, dispatching actions to, to do stuff, and then have, having those action results come back into reducers so you can change your state, and we're going to see the whole flow. Um, we're going to talk about how to separate data from views using containers. Um, this is going to give you some really nice separation of concerns, and uh, we'll talk about more of that later. Uh, we're going to talk about simplifying data relations with selectors. So that's when you have a lot of data from a lot of different places, and maybe you want your views just to deal with like one object. So how do you merge all those in? And also, it has some uh, really nice performance implications. So we'll talk about that. And then the last thing is we're going to talk about business logic. Uh, I'm going to define it because it means different things in different places, and I'm going to tell you how we deal with those kinds of things. So let me take water because my mouth is very dry. Cool. Part one. What is Redux? So Redux is a predictable state container for JavaScript applications. That word is bolded. It's going to come back uh, throughout the talk. Redux help, helps you manage your state or other, like your data. And it's also a nice way to organize your app and separate things really nicely. Um, and the last point here, it, it's going to come back also in the talk. I always like to describe things in like a mathematical way. This is strange loop. I don't need to explain this, like why I do this, but let me explain this. So basically, this is, this is how I look at my app. You have your UI, and then you give it your state, and it becomes an application. Right? The app is what your user interacts with and sees. So we're going to go back to that idea soon. So let's define some things. First of all, when I say state, I mean data. So that's JSON. It's everything your app knows. Um, views is your markup and your display logic. So that's all your React, your JSX, or whatever you choose for your views. Um, there's a thing called actions. So those actions, uh, by now, let's just say they do network calls and changes to state. So it's like where you do work, basically. Reducers tell your app how to respond to those actions and update the state. And we're also going to talk about middleware later. And all you need to know at this point is that they extend the functionality of your app. Uh, before we move on, I would like to talk about pure functions. Who here knows about pure functions? Who here uh, had their life changed by pure functions when they learned about them? Cool. Me too. Um, so pure functions have a definition. Their output is determined only by their input values, and they have no observable side effects. Uh, we're going to see some examples in a second. But basically, it means that it's a function that all it needs to know it takes in as its arguments. Uh, and then its output is predictable and repeatable. It'll always give you the same output. So here's an example of an impure function. I have a greet function. It takes in my name, JC, and it results in good morning, JC. But I'm, uh, in this example, I'm calling it at 11.59 AM. But if I call it at 12 PM, 
it says, good afternoon, JC. So it has a different output. So something's happening there that's it's causing a different output. Um, and obviously, this is, a, this is a really silly example. But like in other applications, that, this means that you don't exactly know what your function is going to output at any particular time. Um, so an example of a, the same function written in a pure manner is this, where you pass in the time. So that now the function has everything it needs to know to give you your output from the parameters. And so you are actually the person who, who's controlling uh, the time in this case. And this is a lot easier, like for example, for testing, right? How do you test the other one? Like your tests are going to fail depending on whether you run it in the morning or at night. Uh, but in this, this case, uh, you can control exactly um, what to test. Also, you can control things like what if the time mechanism fails and gives you back an empty string or null? You can check that in your test really easily. Uh, OK, so they're testable. They're predictable. They give you the same results every time. And they're clean, so they don't have any side effects or dependencies. So that means if you're working on this function here and you change it, it's, uh, you know, well, sorry, if you're working on another thing over here in your app, it's not going to break your function that's over here because it doesn't depend on other things. Um, so impure functions. So side effects are a part of life. They're not necessarily bad, right? Um, there are things like API calls, uh, random numbers, checking time, user input, uh, and every pro program contains both pure and impure things. So it's not like it's bad, but you do want to kind of like know where your impure functions are so that you know what part of your app will give you surprises. And you know, bugs are surprises, crashes are surprises. So it's good to know to have like, oh, it might be this part where everything's impure. Cool. OK, now we know all that we need to know to talk about Redux. So Redux has three principles. One, it has a single source of truth. And again, this is strange loop, so we're going to be like super like, uh, you know, purist about this. So this, in this case, means there's only one place in your app with data. right? You're not keeping multiple things. Your components aren't keeping data. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, state is read only. Nothing can change your state, so your components can't change your state. Only Redux can. And in fact, it doesn't actually change the state. It creates a new state and then replaces the state. Lastly, changes are made with pure functions. Um, we're going to talk about this later, but we know what pure functions are, so this is like the third principle. OK, now we got to one of my favorite slides, which is the Redux cycle slide. So you start with state, and state, again, is just data. And what you want to do with state is show it to the user, right? And so your views take the state, and you have an app, and you show it to the user. So at this point, you have an app that the user can see and interact with, just with these two things. But it'll be a boring website because you can't do anything yet until uh, you have actions. So if your user interacts with your site, or uh, like there's like, you know, it mounts, or there's like a browser event, you can send actions. And actions talk to the internet. Actions do things. You know, the work is done there. Then the results come back, and the action results, the reducers takes the action results and the state, and it's going to update the state for you. And you know, this is a cycle. So now with a new state, it goes down to the views, and your views get updated, and everyone's happy. So let's talk about state first. So again, here's our recommendation page. Um, and this is a really cool exercise to do if you haven't done Redux yet, is take a look at your pages and try to see what your state will look like. Right? So in this case, we have a title, a watch if, like streaming information, information, where to watch it, if it's saved, if it's liked. Um, and the state is you know, a combination of these things. Because we don't not only have information for our reducer, we, we have information about our user, or our app, or many things. So another thing you can define, which I think is pretty neat in Redux, is your initial state. So for example, here's our actual initial state for our recommendations. We can see an empty recommendation object. The GWI info, I meant to change that, is streaming information. Uh, you can see if there was a fetch error, and you can see if it's saved or not. And actually, like right now, you have a pretty good idea of what this page looks like. But let, let's look at a better example, because this is more like typed out. So this is for our list page. Uh, we have an ID, a title, a byline, a description, list items, saved recs by slug, so save, saved information. 
you can take this and kind of like think like, oh, you need a page and it needs to have, needs to have a title, needs to have a byline. Like the design is mirrored in this initial state, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, okay, so you have your state. Now you need to show it to your user. So your views, again, markup and display logic, React and JSX. So Redux state is passed in through this dot props. So this is like a practical, like when you're programming, this is not the same as this dot state in React. In fact, I'm going to say that if you're doing Redux all the way, do not use this dot state to update your state. Everything has to go through Redux. I see some nodding. Cool. Um, also, views, again, fire actions uh, through user, the user interactions or browser events. And so now we're ready to come back to this function, right? Your application is a, you know, is when you give state to your UI. So the app is like the output of that function. So here is our recommendation page. And it actually, this is like the empty state. And the user's never going to see this because we do server-side rendering. But this is what it looks like when you take, literally you take the state out. And it's just like a shell of a page, right? And by the way, you can do like nice things. You, you can like tell the user, oh, we haven't fetched your data yet. We haven't done that. On the other side, you have your data, right? So what happens, what, the way I think about this is, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, hopefully someone here has used a sponge, right? A dry sponge. Um, when you put it in water, it just like soaks it all up and becomes alive. That's how I think about this. When you combine these two things, you get, uh, besides a nice animation, a full website, and it's like, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, this also, what, what's in, in this function too is, is the inherent separation of your views and your state, right? Because your UI is there to just grab a state and display something. Um, it's, not, it's not necessarily there to like, do data stuff and calculations. It's just there to like, take in your state. That's the way I think about it, by the way. Cool. So the next step is actually doing something. And again, strange loop. I can quote the Haskell docs. It's great. Uh, I can't do that anywhere else. Uh, but actions examine and modify the current state of the world. OK? Um, they're invoked as a result of events in views, like mounting or user interactions. And they can happen asynchronously. So if you're making a network call, you, know, you have to wait until you get the data, blah, blah, blah. And they can also happen synchronously, like opening a pop-up. Uh, I mean, you may check with your server before you open a pop-up or not, but usually you just want to tell your app, like, hey, open this window. No waiting. So some definitions. Um, there's this thing called actions, and as the Redux docs define it, it's a payload of information. It tells your app what, like, what happened and any data associated with it. There's a thing called action creators, which is a function that returns actions. And there's this thing called dispatch, which is a, a Redux function that you give it an action, and it takes it through that cycle that we talked about. Um, I also like to call action, action results, because it, like, for me, it communicates better that it's just a JSON object. Uh, and action, to me, is like you're going off and doing something, but that's not exactly what the naming convention is. So here's an example. This function, show watchlist popover, is an action creator, and it returns an action in this case, a simple one that just has a type, right? So when my reducer sees it, it'll see this type and it'll know to like, do something. Oh, the user pressed this button, we should show this popover. That's it for actions. Reducers, they tell your app how to change the state. They're pure, so they're predictable. And again, you don't want any surprises. That's how bugs happen. Um, that's why the third, uh, you know, tenant of, has, of Redux is there. So it computes a new state based on the result of an action, so that payload, and your current state. So that's, again, a little mathematical way to put it. It's a function that takes in your current state and an action, and it gives you back a new state. And let's look at an example. So again, current state dot action result equals new state. So if here's my current state, as you can see, Oh, wait, there's my action results. There we go. OK, so my current state says I'm not logged in. But the action result says, OK, you logged in. Like, that's, this is the thing that happened. So your reducer has to get back the same state, only with the differences based on that action. In this case, 
that I, I am logged in now. Uh, here's more examples. So, oh, I mean, uh, this is the way you would actually type it out, I guess. You have your old state and your action, right? And you're updating the old state with the result of the action. In this case, am I logged in or not? Uh, and then your view can grab that state and do whatever it wants. Um, you have to return new objects. It doesn't, you can't just like change a property in an object and return it. It has to be a completely new object. Um, that's one of the rules. Cool, so I promised you real life examples. Uh, so here we go. Just as a reminder, uh, here's our recommendation page. Broad City, great show. Um, and secondary reminder, we can tell people where to watch Broad City, right? But this data is coming from a third party provider, so we can't like server site load it or anything. So we have to make another call for that data. So we're gonna go through how we make that call and update the UI. Cool, fetching streaming info. So there's a couple things we need uh, here. First, we tell the app that we are loading new information so that the, the UI can then show a spinner or something. The second action is to tell the app, hey, we got the data. This is great. Show the data. The third action is, hey, there was an error fetching the, er the data. Maybe you want to show like an error message or something, right? So here are the different action creators that we need. We need an action creator that, that tells the app that we're fetching something. So in this case, rec info fetch started is the type. And we, set, we can send in the rec ID if we want or, or whatever. Then in the reducer, right? Um, we look out for that type, update the state, and tell the app that we are fetching. And then the view can just grab the thing and say, hey, are we fetching? Show a spinner. If we're not, show, like, do something else. OK. We fetch the info. We have it. And as you can see up there, um, it takes in two things, a rec ID and an info. And so actually, I'm not sending the rec ID in the action. So this is a good example on how you can ignore arguments. Um, so. We tell the app, hey, we fetched the info, and here it is in the result. Here's what the reducer looks like. Um, so it takes in, again, the old state and the action, and it gives back a new state with the differences, in this case, telling the app that, that hey, we're not fetching, so stop whatever spinners you're spinning. And also, here's the streaming info. No error. We're good. Third type is, uh, the th third thing that we need is, there was an error. so. We can say, like, hey, there was an error. Here's the error message. And it takes in an error for the arguments. And in the reducers, again, we saw this before. Uh, old state, action, new state with the differences. Hey, we're no longer loading, but there was an error, right? And so right now, we, we've just made the action creators. We haven't actually fetched anything yet. We just prepared and laid out the groundwork to do the actual fetching. So here's an example of an asynchronous action creator. Sorry for the text, uh, a lot of code, but basically we can highlight it. So here's the first action creator that we made. We're fetching the info. Here's the second one that, oh no, here's the API call, right? So we're going to our API to get the info. If it's successful and we have the info, we tell the app, hey, we succeeded, here's the info. And if there's an error, we send, oh, I should have sent the error in there. But basically you can send the error in there to update the state. And then the other thing that to notice here is that we're using dispatch to grab these actions that are returned by the action creators and take them through the cycle. And that's it. Uh, that's all you need to know to make an app with Redux. And actually, this is all I knew when I shipped watching for the first time. Um, so yay, cool. But the talk isn't over yet. Uh, there's more parts. Um, OK, reminder before we start part two talking about containers. We have cards. They're everywhere in carousels. Carousels are where, when multiple cards are in one place, and you can like swipe through them or whatever. Um, so let's talk about containers, because the these are the things that I started learning about uh, after I shipped an app and had time to actually learn about Redux. So they bridge Redux to your React views. And a bridge links two things together, but you know the two things are separate, which I think is an app metaphor. Um, so no re Redux in your React. And so what you should be doing in your views and your React is only focus on turning data into views and some callbacks. That's all you should be thinking about. So containers help you separate those two concerns. 
Um, so you can also define and filter what data each components receive. If I'm working on my streaming info thing, it shouldn't be getting information about whether something is saved or not, and you can control that. Um, and also, it allows you to like, handle things you don't necessarily want in your views, like analytics. We'll get to that again later in another idea. But basically, like, you can start taking things away from your views so that all you're doing is doing React in your views and then having those containers like, link everything together. So here is a rough sketch of our app uh, after we launched. And again, cards you can save and stuff, right? So we had a feature request where we had to implement liking for cards, right? So if you like a thing like Rock City, Broad City, you can click the heart on the card and it'll like it. And uh, basically, we had an issue because if you can, cards are everywhere, and they're like the leaves in this, this tree of this application. So if we wanted to implement like in cards, um, if you see the little stars, that means that we changed the thing. So we had to change all the cards, right? And then if you look at the very top, that app has a thick border. That means it has access to the data via a container. Okay? So containers give you access to the data. So everything else was just getting data through props. So we changed the cards, and we changed app so that we got the new like data, right? And, but the problem is we have to connect those dots. So in order to implement something in cards, which are everywhere, we had to change our feed, the posts, the carousels, the rec pages, the watch list, the search. And right now there's a problem, right? How come adding one feature in this card thing means that we need to touch our whole app? Um, it takes time. It's, you know, you're changing more files, so there's more entropy and, and possibilities for bugs. Um, so that's no bueno. Cool. So you can use multiple containers. And that means you can give parts of your components access to data more easily. And you should definitely consider it when you know, adding functionality like, like this involves many different files. And the way I see it, you should use them for codes that's super essential. So like our cards, they're everywhere. They're super essential. Or also for code that's, quote, non-primary, end quote, to the app, like ads. Right? So sometimes ads has requirements like, hey, you need to change this thing. And we only want to make that change in one place because if, if, if otherwise we have to change like our whole app for this like requirement. That's all, not, not very good. And so there is a trade-off, right? Like why wouldn't you use multiple containers everywhere? Um, it, there's a trade-off between access to state versus pure components. Because now, for example, if we share our uh, feed, it's not going to be shareable to another team unless they're also using Redux, right? Because they need the idea of containers. So now we can, we can share this like, card component, but not the card container, and definitely not the feed container that includes, uh, you know, sorry, the feed component that includes containers in it. So there's, there's trade-offs. Cool. So how does that same problem apply now that we're using multiple containers? As you can see in the bottom, the cards now have thick borders. That means that their, their components are wrapped by containers, and they have access to the data directly to the, the store. So basically, we just change the cards component, and that's it. And it's uh, a lot better. <laughs> Your diffs are a lot smaller. Um, but again, you know, there's trade-offs. So I would definitely recommend in cases like this where there's, you have one important component across your whole app. OK, we've gotten to part three, simplifying data relationships with selectors. And before we talk about selectors, we can talk about derived data. Who here knows about derived data, kind of? Cool. Um, so derived data is data that you can calculate from your state. Uh, the goals of this is to store the least amount of possible states. Okay, So for example, if you're working on a database right, and you have a user, a user has a first name, a user has a last name, and you want to display like you know full name, are you also going to store the full name when you can just compute it by adding the first name and the last name? So in this case, the full name is a derived data. You can also uh, derive data like uh, combine data from multiple sources. So if we have our recommendation from the New York Times and our streaming information from a third party, we can make this object that has data from multiple sources. So merging data. Here's an example. We have our posts. We have our save state. So it tells us whether an ID is either saved or not in this user, the user's save thing. And we can derive a single object 
that merges the post. And if you can see down there, uh, it has an is saved equals true. So now we have this object that comes from two sources, which is really handy. Cool. So selectors are the things that you use to, to compute derived data. There's a library for this. They're composable, so you can use selectors and other selectors. And the cool thing is also they're memoized, so you can, like, they're not recomputed unless things change. They're, like, cached. So you get some performance benefits, when, especially when you're doing, like, really, like, a lot of data and you're combining them. It won't recombine them. It'll remember them and won't recombine them unless something changed. So here's some examples. Uh, here, this is the simplest kind of selector. So basically, uh, the selector is called get posts. You give it a state, and it knows where in your state to get the post, right? Same here. Save status is by ID. Where in my state is this? It's in the watch list part. Cool. So here is an actual selector. So we're creating a selector. And the way this syntax works is you give it an array of selectors and a function where the arguments of the function mirror. It's like the result of the array that you sent in. So we're sending in get post, the selector that we just made in the previous slide. And we're getting posts here. So it got the posts, right? Same thing, get save statuses. It got the save statuses. And what we're doing here is, again, we're ex expanding the posts, each post, to inject the save data to it so that each post now has, hey, this thing is saved. Um, here's another example. So this is the one we made in the previous slide. So we're chaining selectors now. Here are the posts with the save statuses. Here's the, the streaming info ID, so like where to watch something. And again, we're injecting the information of where to watch something into this object, this post object. So at the end of this chain, our, our watching posts from the New York Times has information from our like save servers and also information from a third party right, in it. And um, oh, yes, the other thing is I found uh, so basically, if a user saves something, that selector is going to become invalid and recompute, right? If the streaming service changes, this selector on this slide is going to be needed to recompute. But the problem is that the user is going to save something more often than the streaming service change. So actually, while making these slides, I found a performance opportunity, improvement opportunity in our code, which is pretty cool. So we should flip, right? Uh, we, should change, we should start the selectors for things that don't change, change often and end with the things that change more often. Cool. OK, business logic. So I have my own definition for business logic. And it's the things that people tell you to add to your app. Uh, it's stuff that's non-essential to the user for an optimal experience of the product. I hope that isn't too forced. Um, but yeah, so basically, I mean, working at a company, you get a lot of requirements from a lot of different teams, and they all expect it to happen quickly. And you as a developer don't want that rush or expectation to like mess things up uh, organizationally or like for bugs or whatever. So here, I'm talking specifically in my experience about analytics, onboarding, and ads, right? So we're going to talk about some best practice to implement this with using pure components and having Redux help us along. So the first thing is, is app on clients? We need to differentiate between server-side renders and client-side re renders. Because for example, we have some front-end libraries that if we render on the server-side, it breaks things, right? So we need to be able to, to say, hey, if you're in the server, do not render this. Um, also, those renders have to be the same as in the client. So the client also has to do a server-side render. Before it, mount, before it mounts on the client, right? Because otherwise, the two disks are going to be invalid. And then, what, you know, I guess it's out of the scope of this talk. Um, so we also want to avoid using internal state. Like, we could do this by saying, this.state.update, you're not in the client. When you mount, you say, OK, now you're on the client, and have your component like redo that thing. But we want to avoid it, because that makes the component impure. And it'll like, you know, behave differently depending on the circumstances where it is. Um, and we do this by adding something to our state that we just call is app on client. So we can do this uh, through Redux, and I'll show you how in a second. But basically, all we have to do now is if you're in the client, do this. If you're not, do this. And we do it all through our Redux state. And we avoid kind of like setting local state. 
The other thing we do is like window size. So like advertising, this is a real requirement. They need a different URL call based on whether the user is on a mobile device or a desktop device. Now this is hard for me because for me there's no such thing as mobile or desktop. It's all just one web page and it, it, there's no difference, right? And you can't do it with responsive techniques because in this case, ad advertising was using it to like analytics, right? So you, like doing it responsively is you put both in the HTML and you hide one depending on your screen size, right, using CSS. But in that case, it would load both images so it would like double count our analytics and that's not good. So the solution is to only render this ad when we knew the window size and we had the same technique where we, when the app mounts, we update our Redux state with the window size, whether it's mobile or desktop. And once we know that, not before, we render this ad. And that leads me to something that I'm calling an impure top component. By the way, this was like an epiphany I had yesterday. Um, so basically what we do, what I try to do in my application is get rid of all of the impure functions and take them all the way up to the topmost component. Because at least I know that if something weird's happening, that's where all my impure stuff is and everything else is going to be w like well behaved. So there's our initial state for our app. We have our window size on mount and our is app on client with their initial values. And then when the app component mounts, we can update those things, right? So this bottom function only runs when we're in the browser. And so we update the window size and we app update the if you're on the client or not. Um, so middleware, we had this issue where we had to update the URL based on a search tag, right? So if you click on um, reality, we want the URL to say, you're looking for bidge-worthy reality shows. Um, so middlewares exist between the action and the reducer, right? And they respond to actions before or after a state is updated. They're composable, so you can have a chain of them, and they're very useful for implementing side effects. So back to this issue, um, the way that we did it was when you click a tag, we just take it through Redux, it updates the store, and we use the middleware to say, okay, what's the new state? And based on that, we just have a function that maps the, your new state to your URL, and we update the URL. Because otherwise, you know, you can't do this in the reducer because you're having a side effect, you're changing the URL. You can do this in an action, but it's weird to be like, okay, update tags and URL. Like, they seem like two different things. And you could chain them, but again, you can make them asynchronous. It's kind of weird. Um, and you shouldn't do it in your views, right? Because then you have to wait until your component gets new props and then check the new state and the old state. And also your logic will be like in two different places. So it's, it's complicated. It's a lot easier with middleware. And the takeaway with middleware is you can now describe things, side effects, in a functional manner instead of just chaining them. So here's a skeleton. This is how you would, this is like how middle, middlewares work. You can first check if you're interested or not in the action that's being run. You can get the state before you run, you run the action through the reducer. You can, then you have to run the action through the reducer. And then you get the state after it. So what we do here is we update the state, we grab the state, and then get the selected tags, and then just have this function that maps this new state to this new URL. So it's very nice. And then quickly, so for onboarding, you can also do this. You can describe onboarding events. So if the user clicks on a thing, right, you can use middleware to say, like, OK, they click save. Is this their first time in the app? Because you have that in Redux. And then based on that, you can show this onboarding thing, right? Instead of describing this logic in your views, you have this in another place for middleware. Um, and then, yeah, tightly coupled. Same thing for analytics. You can have this middleware that grabs your analytics and just like, like sends stuff uh, like crazy, or you can like filter and select which events you're, um, you want to send to analytics. Uh, the other thing is you ha you'll have a nice mapping between your Redux actions and your analytics. So if your analytics person's like, hey, what, like, what do we do with analytics? You can just send them all your Redux actions and have them deal with it. OK, so now we're almost done. This is the last slide. We saw how views take in state to display an app. We saw how views can dispatch actions to like, do stuff in the world and create a result. That result is then passed on to the reducer, and the reducer knows how to update your state based on what happened. And then the state goes through the views, and everything happens over again. 
the new things that hopefully we learned today is we have containers and selectors that help you deal with data, combine them and, and memoize them and all that fun stuff, and separate your Redux from just focusing on pure uh, React views. We have middleware that can do stuff before and after reducers, and middleware is a great place where you can describe side effects instead of having to do it in, uh, imperatively somewhere else. And then the last thing that I hope you take away is always compartmentalize your impure stuff. Um, so what I like to do is just like send it either to the top component or to the actions so that everywhere else in my app, everything is well behaved. And this is actually something, the separation of concerns with Redux and with pure and impure is something that allowed uh, us in the watching team to just build a website you know, in less than a year, pivot, like we had to change our whole UI and it was really easy because we just changed that views part. Nothing else changed. We also refactored the way that we save and store save. And in that case, we just changed the reducer part and nothing else changed. Um, so this is something very powerful. So if you're looking to move quickly with less mistakes, um, this is something that you should do. Thank you.